Another week, another cyber attack. This one on JBS, that is the largest meat supplier in the world, with no sense yet of how big this is or how long the effects may last. Welcome now someone who has been warning us about attacks like this for years. He's Michael Chertoff. He was Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security under President George W. Bush. He is co-founder and executive chairman of the Chertoff Group and author of the book Exploding Data, Reclaiming Our Cybersecurity in the Digital Age. Uh, so, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for being with us. Reclaiming our cybersecurity sounds like a good idea right now. What do we need to do in order to achieve that? Well, it does, David, and I think we've seen an acceleration of the scale and the tempo of cyber attacks. Part of that, I think, is because as more of us operate virtually, <clears throat> we've created a larger surface area, and it also means we're more at risk in the sense that the consequences of shutting down a part of a network can be even more dire now than that would have been the case several years ago. And so we've seen, uh, you know, the solar winds attack, which was launched by Russian intelligence, which embedded malware and or exploited um, a vulnerability in literally thousands of networks because they infected some software. We saw the colonial pipeline shut down as a result of a ransomware attack, and, and those have stepped up. And then we saw the attack against the meat company. We don't quite know yet the nature of the attack, but it required them to shut down their operations. And that shows the extent to which our food supply, our health system, and our energy is dependent on cybersecurity. Well, you suggested it, Michael. It sounds right to me. We're almost uh, connecting faster than we can defend against the people attacking it as a practical matter. Can we keep up with these people? Do we really get our arms around who's doing and what they're doing and how we could defend? Well, I think we, we have a pretty good idea who's doing it. The question is, how do we upstep the temper of our defenses? And I think one of the things that the Biden administration has done with this new executive order is try to get the federal government and vendors to put a much more robust and detailed system of preparation for defense in place as quickly as possible. And that means recognizing not only that you have to defend the network itself, but you have to have visibility into the people who are supplying the critical software and hardware. You have to know who you're connected to. You have to test. You have to constantly modify based on new threat information. And you have to have a plan, a backup plan, if something happens. And I think that's a good model for all of our major institutions. Um, and I think increasingly after Colonial Pipeline and the, and the attack on the meat company, this is going to be topic number one in most corporate boards. We also, as I understand it, are about to have a requirement that people report when they've had a cyber attack on infrastructure, something that we lacked before. Uh, is, is that in and of itself potentially very helpful? Because if you don't know what's going on, that's hard to defend. At the same time, are people reluctant to report because they're afraid it might trigger, for example, lawsuits? Well, I, I, for, so it's actually TSA, which, among other things, has responsibility for pipeline regulation that has issued the mandate with respect to pipelines. And the reason the reporting is important is, A, it gives everybody else warning. They ought to you know, be on the alert and be vigilant. It also means that everybody can kind of pool their examination of the nature of the attack and then determine what particular kinds of techniques were used, and that helps defend ourselves. So this is a case where it's like you know pulling a fire alarm. You want to warn everybody in the neighborhood there's a fire, so that they know how to take preparations to protect themselves. So again, this is a good and, and maybe overdue step. A further step, as I understand it, is the Biden administration is proposing in their budget to have $15 million, which is a lot of money to some people, maybe not in terms of the budget, to have a new national cyber director to coordinate across, located, as I understand it, in the White House. Is that necessary and appropriate? Well, I mean, actually, the person who's been nominated, Chris English, is a very experienced, you know, former deputy head of the National Security Agency, and has a lot of, of in-depth knowledge. And I think having somebody who is tasked, not necessarily to operate all the levers, but to coordinate in the public and private sector can be helpful. We saw that with counterterrorism with the NCTC, the National Counterterrorism Center, which, again, didn't operate the various elements of counterterrorism, but coordinated and made sure there was a master strategic plan. 
Uh, Michael, you said we basically know where this is coming from, and an awful lot of it seems to come from Russia. If not the government, then certainly from people located in Russia. Many people are saying not much goes on like this in Russia that, that Mr. Putin doesn't know something about, maybe even condone. Should we be taking, maybe we are taking action specifically to threaten or act against Russia for just actually permitting these, uh, these uh, cyber terrorists to exist on their land? David, I think this is dead right. I think some of the attacks are actually being launched by intelligence services of the Russian government, like the SDR, and that was the case with the Solar Winds attack. But for example, Colonial Pipeline was a group, I think, called Dark Space, which is we haven't attributed to the government, but is located in Russia. And it's an open secret that the Russians tacitly condone this kind of activity as long as it's aimed outside of Russia. And part of the reason for that is the Russians benefit when uh, we get harassed. And also, these actors then become available to the Russian government should they need to co-opt them for purposes of actually engaging in more deliberate uh, uh, attacks. I think we need to seriously think about moving beyond simply uh, having sanctions and financial penalties. And maybe we need to start to think about having the government take steps to disable some of the tools and some of the servers which these criminal actors are using in order to attack us. Because when you start getting into critical infrastructure, it's not just about stealing money or intellectual property. It could actually cost people their lives. And at some point, there has to be a, a more serious consequence for this than just indicting people who are never going to be brought in front of a U.S. federal court. Michael, let's turn from cybersecurity to physical security, and specifically those awful acts that we all witnessed on January 6th up at the Capitol. We're interrupting the counting of the voting uh, uh, for the for the um, for the voting for presidency, and actually threatening the lives of some lawmakers. There's a dispute now on Capitol Hill, as you know, about whether there should be a commission uh, convened to do it, sort of like the 9/11 Commission. What is your take on that? Because you not only ran uh, Homeland Security, you also were a federal court of appeals judge, Third Circuit, and also were, were a senior senior member of the Justice Department. Well, after every major catastrophic physical event uh, in this country, at least in my lifetime, we've had some kind of a bipartisan independent commission to take a dispassionate look at what are the lessons learned. That was true after the Kennedy assassination. It was true after Watergate. It was true after 9-11. And I think it's overdue here. First of all, we need to understand what failed in terms of securing the Capitol against what seems to me to have been a fairly predictable attack. We also need to understand what led up to it. What were the signs that perhaps were missed? What were the signs that were caught but didn't get acted upon? Because we've got to stop this from happening again. And David, make no mistake, much as I'd like to believe this is a one-off, I think there are people out there that want to duplicate this and who believe the way to uh, get the electoral result they want is simply to threaten the people who are adjudicating the election so they wind up simply picking the person with a bigger set of guns. So we've got to build in protections for our democracy, not only against foreign actors, as we've been talking about, but frankly, against domestic actors. And an important step in that would be an independent bipartisan commission with a mandate to look at this. So, uh, as you say, it's been done every time in the past that had any similarity to this at all. Why isn't it happening this time? I is this just partisanship, plain and simple? Is there a risk now in, in our capital of partisanship getting in the way of national security and even law enforcement? I don't think there's any doubt that we're seeing partisanship interfere with law enforcement and national security. I mean, this is a security issue. And as some Republicans have observed, like, for example, Representative Cheney, uh, this is a, an attack, was an attack on our democracy. It was explicitly designed to stop a process that the Constitution creates that would have been the final step in ratifying the selection of the people who voted in November in large numbers. And we have to be concerned now that other things will become the subject of partisanship and that will paralyze the ability of Congress and the federal government to take the steps we need to protect our democracy and to protect our lives. So, I mean, this is a real moment of conscience. And I have had some conversations with you know, members of Congress, Republicans, who I'm not going to name, who privately said to me they're appalled that we can't get it together 
to do this. And I think that this is a moment of courage that we need to summon on the part of all of our political leaders. A moment of courage, but a lot of political courage is required because, as you mentioned, Representative Cheney, she certainly she lost her leadership position over it. Well, that's right. But the point is, what's more important, having a title or being able to look at yourself in the mirror and saying, I am living up to my oath of office and I am part of the long line of defenders mm -hmm. of the United States that have protected our democracy. You know, we had Memorial Day yesterday, David, and that's a reminder that there are people who laid down their lives not just for the territorial integrity of the country, but for the values that this country stood for. And that ought to inspire us and, and maybe shame some of us into doing the right thing.